okay. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go buy this. Check out. Wait. Wow, that was really fast shipping. Cool. My merch is here. Hey y'all, welcome back to episode three of Learn to Fly. In this episode, we'll go over a bunch of changes and improvements that have been introduced to our My Dash app since the previous episode. Then we'll go ahead and jump into the highlight of this episode, the all new Dash Shop, where we'll take a look at what a theoretical merch store for Dash would look like and how I would implement it. Of course, it wouldn't be learning to fly without hitting some turbulence along the way. So we'll also talk through some of the problems I ran into and how I resolved it. And finally, we'll wrap up with some questions for Fitz. Let's get started. In the previous episode, we went over our fancy new Dash theme. We looked at the dashboard UI and discussed some of the road bumps that I had run into, including, but not limited to, the bottom navigation bar. Since then, I took some of the notes that we got from the last episode and made some changes to my dash. First off, I was able to resolve my issue with accessing my dash theme colors. As some of you pointed out, I had a road const that I had overlooked. Oops. Furthermore, based on another suggestion, I pulled my dash theme into a separate file so that it's more organized and doesn't get all cluttered up in the code. Finally, from the discussion with Fitz, my comment now is, well, more properly formatted and wraps around underneath the username thanks to rich text and text span. While I was at it, I also changed the username so that it distinguishes between post captions and comments just a little bit more. Finally, I pushed date as low as possible at the dashboard level, just like how it appears in the app, just above the card level. Now, with all that covered, we can jump into the Dash Shop. When I thought about building a Dash merch store and what it would look like, this is what I came up with. And this here is the coded up Flutter version. You have the main shop page where there's a grid view of cards containing an image, name, and price for each of the products. There's a row at the top for the typical filter button and search box, but shh, don't tell anyone. It doesn't really do anything quite just yet. From there, we can tap on one of the cards and be taken over to the product page. The neat part here is that I was able to use the hero widget to animate from the shop page image to the product page image. It took about a whole minute for me to watch the widget of the week episode for it. We'll link to it up there as well. And another minute to add the code. And Voila, it just worked. As for the product page images, they're rotating through using a carousel slider. The size selector is a toggle buttons widget and a drop down button for the quantity selector. And of course, an elevated button for our must have add to bag functionality. Now let's say I wanted to buy a sweatshirt in size medium. I only want one for myself. I hit add to bag and it jumps me back to the shop page. From there, we can tap the bag button, which then will take us to our, well, our bag. And there you'll see our final page, our shopping bag with all of our stuff. The shopping bag is fairly simple. It's made up of a list view of cards, again, for the product previews. You also have the price calculations at the bottom and finally a checkout button. So when you hit checkout, it'll jump you back to the shop page and clear your cart. You're probably wondering, Khan, why? That's not how checkout is supposed to work. Well. Thank you for asking. Let's jump to the decisions and considerations portion of this episode. I had left out the checkout process because I would personally always want to use a payment processor package for that portion of the app, like Flutter Stripe. On the same note, a Flutter cart package also exists, but I decided to build my own cart logic because I thought it would be a good opportunity to write and learn some non-UI code. Bag state lives at the shop level of my app. The inherent problem here is that the bag doesn't persist if I navigate away from the shop page. So in every other scenario, state management would be important here. I suspect using a package like Hive for a NoSQL database would be a nice integration to have. With all that said, I also made a lot of assumptions that I would not have made with a real production ready app, like assuming that there will always be one product image for every product in the shop. This one would be relatively easy to get around by checking if the product has an image, otherwise replace it with a default image. The shop has easily been the most complex part of this app that I've worked on so far, so it's no surprise that I've run into the most hurdles while building it. 
Luckily, as I've been learning Flutter, I've usually been able to look up the thing that I want to do and then just get an idea of the direction that I want to go in. My problems most of the time end up getting solved the same way as well, from figuring out why Flutter was yelling at me about the argument type color can't be assigned to the parameter type material state property to the exception that kept getting thrown for incorrect use of parent data widget. Two Google searches later, I found out that I needed to wrap my color in a material state property all, and that I had a rogue expanded widget that wasn't inside of a row, column, or a flex. So removing the expanded widget was the answer. That's not to say that I didn't run into issues that took me forever to figure out. Two examples. Number one, left aligning a bunch of text within a column. I truly didn't think I would struggle as much as I did. After a long while of Googling and fighting with my code, I settled for wrapping the text in a size box that takes up the entire width and then set text align to text align dot left. This method still feels a little hacky to me, so I'm guessing there's probably a better way to do this. If you have any recommendations, please drop a comment. I learned that list views also have a default padding because there was a huge gap in my bag list of light items and the top header. I just couldn't figure out why there was so much white space. I also kept getting an overflow error on the cards in my grid view, but adding a size box was no help. Container? Nope. The answer here, as it turns out, was the aspect ratio on my grid view. The aspect ratio defaults to one to one. So the height of the card is constrained by the width of the card, which my card was very much not expecting. And finally, the one problem that I can't seem to figure out, I can't add my entire assets directory to my pub spec without getting an exception. I still haven't figured this one out, so let's phone a friend. Hello? Hi, Fitz. Oh. Hi, this is Khan. Hello. Hi. So I'm on Who Wants to Be At. I, I mean, I'm filming an episode of Learn to Fly, but I have some questions that I would like answers for. Can you help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's do it. What questions do you have for me? Cool. Thanks, Fitz. So my first question for you is, well, I've encountered this problem where in order for me to get access to all of my product images, as an asset, I have to add each of the image paths to my pub spec. If I try to add my directory, just called assets slash, it throws an exception on the load async function. Any ideas there? That's interesting because you should be able to load a full directory. And, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, uh, so I've seen sometimes the trailing slash makes a difference whether you have it or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering if um, like having a subdirectory in the assets helps as well. And, and I'm curious to hear more. What what did you experience and what did you try? Yeah, so when I tried, so originally I had only just one image. It was a picture, uh, it, it was in, like an image of Dash, right? So I didn't really have to add a whole directory. I was just like, okay, let me just add this one image, right? And that worked perfectly fine. Um, and then once I started building the Dash shop, I started adding more product images. And so I decided, hey, like instead of having just like this one image, this one image path, I'm going to make um, a subdirectory within assets that's like called images with a shop directory in addition to that. So that I have all the product images stored in there. Um, and then, so that's when I tried to load in that directory and it didn't work out too well because then it just, the load async function, um, it said something about the key was not loading. So I'm not really sure there. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, and so when you have this assets folder, it's just a, an, an assets directory in the root of your source folder. Yep. Mm -hmm. Huh? I don't know. That's very interesting. Um, you'll have to follow up with me after you learn more about that because I don't know, it should it should be working. Okay, all right, well, let me, let me troubleshoot that and then I'll report back on the next episode then. Sounds great, look forward to the answer. All right, cool. So my next question for you, 
um, is about my shop and product pages. So right now they're pretty tightly coupled. The product page, you know, returns either a product or no. So a product would indicate that the customer wanted to add that product to cart. So the product then gets added to our cart that is stored on the shop page. No would indicate that they just want to exit the product page without adding anything to cart so that, well, it doesn't do anything. Does that sound okay? Well, you know, what is the correct way to, you know, return data, say, from the product page to the main shop page? Okay, that's really interesting because I, I think you want to think about what the purpose of each of those, you're dealing with three different things here. You're dealing mm -hmm. with the, the product, the cart, and the main shopping page, right? Mm -hmm. And and so then your question really is, where is the functionality for adding a product to the cart? And who mm -hmm. is responsible to that for that? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something to think about here because um, should the product be responsible for it adding itself to the cart? Mm -hmm. Should the cart be responsible for adding a product to itself? Mm -hmm. Or should the shopping page be responsible for adding a product to the cart? And mm -hmm. I don't know the right answer, but I think mm -hmm. once you um, really determine that answer, that'll change where what you think about in terms of the returning from the product page into the shopping page. Because right now you're using that return value to indicate whether it needs to be added to the cart. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, that's combining two different notions. You mm -hmm. have the navigation from, from the product page to the cart page and or the shopping page and you also have this idea of adding something to the cart. And I think when you combine those two, I think that's where you end up with this question of, is null the right thing to return or is the product the right thing to turn return? I'm not sure. And maybe the, the not sureness is coming from whose responsibility is it to add to the cart? Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, now that you mentioned that, I'm starting to think it would probably make sense to just completely separate those transitions right between pages so that the cart can handle just the, oh, there's a product we're adding to cart. So that way, when we return, the shop page doesn't need to bother even thinking about what it needs to add to cart or what not to add to cart. Yeah, exactly. The cart could be essentially its own notion of state. And so the product could say, mm -hmm. make a change to this state thing, which is add myself to this cart. And th then mm -hmm. it doesn't have to worry about anything else. And the shop page doesn't have to worry about anything either. It just gets the current state of the state of the cart state. <laughs> Gotcha. I, I think I got it. Gotcha. Okay. Let me, I think I, I, that is definitely one thing I want to go back and try to fix up then because right now it's so tightly coupled that it didn't seem like it was the right way to do that. So thanks, Fitz. All right. I, got, I think I got that down. Cool. Cool. Um, so my next question for you is on the topic of builders. So there's a lot of repetitive widgets in the Dash shop, you know, primarily building the cards. I probably could have used more builders instead of the for loops that I used. I've read heard that builders are supposed to be more efficient than for loops. Why is that? You know, what is the rule there? Is there a place where a for loop should be used instead of a builder? Is there a rule of thumb that I should follow? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the rule is, and, and it's more of a principle than a, a rule. I think rules are meant to be never broken and principles are sometimes broken. Um, but the principle would be use builders where possible. And there's two reasons why. One is that um, in cases like list views or grid views, you'll get a progressive build of mm -hmm. what's on screen is or, or, or maybe just off screen slightly is going to be what's what's built. When you just have a for loop building a static list, it's going to build everything every time. Mm -hmm. um, or you have to do some weird hand waving in order to get it to um, only build some things. And, and that's where the builder comes in because it'll do some of that hand waviness for you mm -hmm. of tr checking what's on screen. The other thing the builder will do is give you a new build context. And that's important for when you need to uh, use things like scaffolds or detect if there's an app bar or try to get the right navigator in order to navigate between your two pages or something like that. That's mm -hmm. important to have a new build context, um, which you won't okay. get if you just use a static for loop list. Oh, okay. I think, right, the build context. Okay, that makes sense. So just as a principle, that's probably a good, a, a good principle to stick by. Not rule, it's a principle. 
Cool. Yep. Let me go back and I'll probably have to check for any for loops I've been using just to try to turn that into builder code instead. Totally. Awesome. So my last question for you is not really a question, more so of just, uh, I guess, a prompt. Uh, do you have any recommendations or feedback on the Dash shop for me, whether that be code review, the UI design, or anything that, that you have, you know? Yeah, I think I was looking through it uh, before this, and um, I think that there's two pieces of feedback. One is there are only like three items. I want more Dash swag items. That would be great, and I would love to buy as many of them as possible. Um, that's one. Noted. I just, just need more <laughs> swag. Uh, right. the, the second one is, um, you know, I noticed some of your widgets were having a lot of code. <laughs> there, there, there was um, uh, many, many lines and some nested um, widgets being in, inside of those build methods, and, and sometimes. You had that one widget, which was encompassing a lot of different things. And I think we talked a little bit about that with the um, the notion of, of who's responsible for adding a product to the cart. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, it looked like from the code perspective, there was a lot going on in each one of these things. And it might be worth trying to think about how to uh, how to segment things out, how to break them up and, and, and how to um, just partition things out a little bit, refactor them into some things. Gotcha. Fitz, you are also being far too nice. I think everything was just one huge build method. So I'm I'm glad you called that out. I will totally go back and fix that up. In terms of, you know, cleaning that up, any recommendations other than if, you know, it's a huge block of code, right? Any like any suggestions where I should start to break that out? Yeah, it's 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 hard to say in a general sense, but I would look for making sure that a widget is responsible for one thing and one thing only. Okay. As much as possible. Do one thing and do it well. Yep. Cool. Okay. That that seems like another good principle that I should uh, should live by when I build the uh, Flutter code. Cool. Um, I think that was all the questions I had for you. Thank you so much, Fitz, for uh, coming by and helping out on such short notice. All right. Absolutely. And feel free to give me an, a ring on my fancy smartphone here. All right. For sure. You will be my first phone a friend. <laughs> Thanks, Fitz. All right. Yep. <laughs> Bye. Good luck, Con. All right, so that just about does it for this episode of Learn to Fly. Thank you all so much for joining. And before we go, I do have a question for you. What Dash merch would you like to theoretically see in the Dash shop? You may see it in the next episode. So that about does it again. Thank you all so much for joining, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>